Prime Prime. So hello everyone, welcome to our first episode for the semester. Um, today's guest is the uh, artistic duo Parkway Hardware. Some of you might be familiar with their work because they had an exhibition not that long ago in uh, the Leopold Hosch Museum in Düren. And we'll see some of the works that they showed there uh, in the presentation today. And um, yeah, as I already said, it's an artistic duo consisting of um, Ugnus Gelgude and uh, Neringa Czernoskaite. And I hope that I haven't pronounced that completely wrong. Yeah, hi there. <laughs> Hello. Live from uh, Vilnius. Yes. Uh, yes, it's already nine o'clock in here, so it's almost nighttime, wine time, but... Uh... Ah, you should have wine. <laughs> we, we, no, we're having better for now. <laughs> Let's okay, see. Maybe later in the Q&A. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So um, after the talk, we have the Q&A as usual, and we will post the link into the Zoom session in the video description and as a comment below. Okay. One thing I'd like to say before we start, because it's um, our first session, and you probably have recognized that we have a new introduction video. Um, and we are very, very happy about it. And uh, it's made by Stella Jermann and Jan Hünkemöller. And the sound, which is perfectly matching the video, is by Christoph Görke. And the new Sparta poster, which you cannot see within the video, but probably have seen around or um, online, is from Simon Wallnöfer. Yeah, thanks for everyone. You did a great job. <laughs> OK, you can start. I switch to presentation mode now. Uh, okay, so hello once again. Um, I'm Neringa. I'm Ugnus. And uh, <clears throat> today we'll speak uh, not so much about the whole uh, practice, like the whole history uh, practice uh, since our inception, because it would take way too long uh, for everyone. Um, so we'll speak mostly about the last four years uh, of, our, of our work. Um, last three and a half years. And uh, probably would make sense to start from the name, um, which might sound a bit weird uh, for some reason. And um, uh, it was maybe meant to be this way. Uh, and the name Pakwi Hardware uh, was actually coined by a fellow curator, Alex Ross from New York. Um, and uh, he coined this term in 2014 when we asked him to come up with, with a name for, for our um, collaboration. Um, and at that time, we made uh, a project which was called The Metaphysics of the Runner, which dealt uh, with, uh, with this kind of hype of uh, hyper 
fitness and hyper fit bodies and kind of extension of bodies. Uh, and so he came up with this name in which Pakwe is actually a Hawaiian mythological character. It's a runner uh, that is able to circle an island six times a day. So it kind of refers to speed and velocity and more like a mythical and semiotic part of, of the world, of the reality. While hardware uh, stands for the material, the matter, the body, um, the resources. Uh, so it's always this kind of friction between these two uh, realms in which uh, one kind of uh, uh, aims at uh, developing fast, evolving and ex expanding while the other is both uh, like a resource for that expansion, but also an obstacle because uh, it constantly kind of slows down uh, this, this um, e e yeah, evaluation, not evaluation, but um, development, let's say. Um, and since the foundation uh, in 2014, we have explored how technologies uh, are shaping bodies and, uh, and how uh, their relationship uh, is changing with the environment. And uh, basically the work tracks uh, how new technological and uh, scientific developments are directly triggered also and accelerated by, by capitalist forces. Um, and throughout uh, these several years, uh, our case studies included synthetic biology, uh, automation, um, and clothing for robots, stomach surgery, tissue engineering, regenerate, regenerative medicine, and a new materiality. And all of this research uh, translates itself into installations or environments, as we call them, uh, in which often natural is blended with artificial and in which sterile technology is taken over by organic dirt, let's say. And over the last uh, now three years and a half, uh, since 2018, we've been uh, very much uh, interested in digging basically into contemporary medicine and how medicine is uh, transforming uh, bodies uh, in, in one way or another uh, through, through its development as well. And it started in 2018 with, um, with a piece, uh, the, the Return of Sweetness, which we showed at Tender Pixel Gallery in London. And here uh, we were interested in bodies, uh, not, not uh, as, as some kind of uh, uh, outward uh, organism, but we were going really literally deeper into the guts uh, of human body and uh, it was mainly focused on metabolism, um, and we tried to track uh, how metabolism, uh, which was which previ previously basically existed uh, on its own terms, in, in a sense that uh, it had its own velocity and its own efficiency, individual one. Uh, but uh, over the last years, it's being constantly monitored. Uh, and uh, controlled from the outside. Basically, one is constantly pushed to um, boost your metabolism uh, to kind of keep up with the pace of, of this fast developing world and fast developing technologies. But at the same time, uh, we all live in this great nutritional decline uh, in which even the fruits and vegetables don't contain enough vitamins so you would need to consume a big much bigger amounts of of fruits to to get what you uh what you would have uh, previously um, before it was so much with filled with pesticides let's say and uh, also not to mention this uh, economic divide and uh who can afford to to choose this healthy lifestyle and uh, eat organically in a sense. So basically we were looking um, at gastritic uh, bariatric surgery uh, or stomach surgeries uh, as 
yeah, to speak uh, more more plainly, uh, in which basically surgeons sculpt, let's say, stomachs. Uh, they fold them, they stitch them, they squeeze them, uh, and basically, yeah, uh, shape shape them in very different ways. And so we were looking at imagery of of how it is done, and so. Um, those glass pieces that um, that you saw in in some of the pictures, and we'll talk about it later a little bit, um, kind of refer to 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 this quite brutal, uh, let's say, um, surgery, uh, which which is done uh, for for people. And at the same time, uh, in this project, we wanted to talk about metabolism uh, more as um, as a metaphor. Uh, which derived from the writings of Mackenzie Bark. Um, and in their book, Molecular Red, uh, they talk about the metabolic rift, uh, which is a point in which the reciprocal relationship with nature loses its balance and the metabolic process gets out of control. Uh, and to quote Wark here, you can read it yourself, um, labor pounds and weedles, rocks, and soil, plants and animals, extracting the molecular flows out of which our shared life is made and remade. But those molecular flows do not return from whence they came. Thus, the Anthropocene is a series of metabolic rifts where one molecule after another is extracted by labor and technique to make things for humans. But the waste products don't return so, they, so that the cycle can renew itself. And so the return of sweetness, the, the project kind of attempted to expose this metabolic rift, both as, as a global, uh, global and general issue, but also as a, as a physical individual process, as a bodily process. So it was a way to connect uh, like a micro scale with a micro scale with, uh, with an internal or inter internal uh, process with external processes. Um, and also in this project, uh, it was the first time we uh, started working with, with glass as material. Um, and we, we decided to work uh, with glass specifically here as a reference to this kind of glass uh, models in anatomical museums. Um, and also we really uh, wanted to have this transparency uh, that we could use by, for example, uh, kind of inserting these silicone guts uh, that also contain chia seeds. So it's kind of a reference to these superfoods uh, that is also aimed at, uh, you know, efficient lifestyle and, uh, um, yeah, like uh, less less food for more energy to participate in uh, in the capitalist expansion. Let's say. Um, we also used uh, transparent PVC uh, film in which uh, we kind of imprinted uh, with the heat treating technique, uh, like abstracted, you could say, uh, like extracted backbones or, or uh, skeletons, but they also uh, look more like industrial made rather than uh, organic or biological. Um, and we also used uh, this uh, textiles that was uh, attached to it with, uh, with latex. Uh, so it's kind of also a reference to the excess tissues that are often um, like a byproduct uh, of, of, these, um, of these surgeries that are done. And so uh, it's, it's this kind of, and also the cables that are, are quite important because the cables also refer to these gastritic bands that are put on, on the stomachs to squeeze them and they kind of, uh, you can uh, control when to squeeze it or release it. Uh, so it's, it's also kind of wired, wired living, but this wire is, is already happening or or is inside or is basically internalized wiring, let's say. Um, and we would like to quote also 
um, like a beautiful text written by a London-based writer, Tamar Clark Brown, uh, in which she also writes about this specific uh, project. So I'll just <clears throat> read it out here. Um, Paku Hardware presents a new configuration that zones in on the metabolic rift, Mackenzie Wark. This is the crisis point of irreversible ecological imbalance, the era of the Anthropocene in which we now live. Working through the metaphor of metabolism, the duo speak from the heart, or rather the belly of all, itself a grossly augmented system, engineered for maximum output, but fatally out of sync. Take it all in, consumption, extraction, consumption, extraction. Metabolic process amped to the max. Cables sluice inside wet, fresh extractions on support. A sacrificial victim of the gastritic economy. The organism lays exposed. Glass, copper pipes, heat treated PVC film, latex, saliva and chia seeds, silicone guts. Interconnected parts lace through the space in an install hung from the rafters, sleek droop systems. Ice slip down rubber tubes and curl around glacier rounds. Molecular red forms crystallize in thermodynamic moments that look like big boil sweets. And uh, the way we work, it, all, it always somehow uh, have, uh, have these moments of deferring the research for another project because you just um, kind of accumulate uh, a big amount of, of material. So you, you kind of need to really uh, limit yourself in order not to go all over the place. So um, it becomes material for the future, uh, future works. And so it also, uh, this, this previous piece led us to uh, a new work uh, that was called Extra Corporal, which we actually showed uh, for the first time. And it was conceived specifically for Kunstverein uh, Bielefeld. Um, and uh, it was made in 2018, at the end of 2018. And uh, in here, extracorporal um, means outside of the body. And basically it turned our, our look from the inside of the body, the guts of the body to, to organs that are growing outside of, of the human body or multiplying organs uh, outside and basically multiplying bodies as well. And uh, this project uh, concentrated on how regenerative uh, medicine and tissue engineering are growing biological tissues and organs outside the limit of bodies. And thus basically opening uh, human bodies for even wider uh, wider circulation of in the so-called tissue economy. And uh, these branches of science uh, deal with the process of uh, replacing, engineering and regenerating human cells, uh, tissues and, or organs. And also this way to restore uh, and, and establish normal function of these organs. And uh, this field, which was interesting for us, uh, also holds promise of engineering damaged tissues and organs by stimulating the body's own repair mechanisms uh, to functionally heal previously uh, irreparable tissues and, or organs. And uh, regenerative medicine also include, includes the possibility of growing tissues in the laboratory or in vitro, as it says, uh, basically autom autonomously from the body itself um, and later implanting them back uh, when the body cannot heal itself. So for us, this specific moment was extremely interesting to kind of speak about uh, the integrity of bodies uh, or, or the boundaries of, of bodies where, where these boundaries end if we can uh, multiply our own tissues and uh, these, these tissues uh, or organs grow next to the bodies basically. So, uh, so, 
So it's not something unique, it can be multiplied. Um, so it was interesting to speculate on the beginnings and ends of, of our own bodies. So it was one of the interesting points for us. And another uh, interesting factor, or let's say kind of a stimulating uh, factor to, to speculate uh, further artistically, let's say, uh, was that uh, this, this specific field um, looks quite a lot into uh, non-human species or on different kind of mostly aquatic species uh, as, as kind of resources uh, for, for their own research. Um, and not only as, as uh, research material, but, uh, but using their actual blood and actual bodies for, for those research. And one of those uh, species is uh, the so-called immortal jellyfish or Toritopsis dorni, uh, which is dispersed around Mediterranean and in the waters around Japan. And uh, this cute little, extremely tiny uh, jellyfish uh, is basically able to escape uh, pure death by transforming itself um, into a grown-up medusa, then back into polyps or their colonies, and then back uh, into grown-up medusa as well. So it's kind of a Benjamin Button <laughs> aging in reverse, uh, just to most uh, extreme part that you just never die, basically. Uh, you just uh, renew yourself again and again, endlessly. Um, and so what is interesting is that uh, the scientist uh, cannot kind of crack that uh, secret of how the cells manage to differentiate uh, without dying. and. Scientifically, this process uh, of, of constant um, self mutation is called transdifferentiation. So, basically, or as it's called otherwise, lineage programming. And basically, it's a process in which one mature cell transforms itself uh, into another type of cell. So, basically, they de differentiate and then re differentiate. Uh, into the cell type of, type of interest. So the scientists cannot, so far at least, cannot crack this moment, how they differentiate without dying. Um, and yeah, it's quite fascinating how some, someone or something uh, having no brain manage, manages to live forever while we have all these uh, technological arms and and rational minds and we still can't do it basically. Um, and another aquatic animal that is widely used uh, in scientific, uh, medical scientific research is uh, horseshoe crabs. Um, and this, uh, this medical research and surgery relies heavily on the blue blood of, of these horseshoe crabs because uh, this blood uh, has this very exceptional antiseptic uh, quality. Um, basically, their blood contains uh, important immune cells that are exceptionally sensitive to toxic bacteria. So when the toxic bacteria uh, invades, uh, invades the organism of, of uh, horseshoe crabs, let's say, these uh, these immune cells, they clot around the, those uh, infected bacteria to protect uh, the organism from infection. And so uh, this specific uh, quality is very useful for, for medical research. And it was used quite a lot as well uh, while, making, uh, while making the COVID uh, in, uh, in injections, what do you what do you call it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. yeah like AstraZeneca, you name it. Uh, and so it's interesting also because uh, 
vaccines. Vaccines, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because uh, also these uh, these specific animals uh, are called uh, living fossils because they've been around uh, uh, the planet for 415 million years and now their bodies are basically uh, harvested or sh uh, taken from, from, from the sea and they're brought to these blood centers where uh, their blood is drained, around 30% of their blood is taken away, and then they're shipped back and released. Um, uh, so it's a bit of a vampiring uh, process that humans are doing in that sense. Uh, but uh, the population declines also because, uh, because of the stress that they, that they sense uh, during this blooding process or bleeding process, let's say. Um, and especially the females, the fertility of the females is, is plummeting to kind of dangerous lows. And so it was interesting for us how basically this heart science uh, seek rejuvenation. And this way it emerges this uh, contemporary technology and heart science with almost shamanistic kind of ways of extracting secrets and uh, healing uh, healing capabilities from other species. Um, and so this installation uh, that you're seeing here uh, is kind of an attempt to, to show these two, two different cosmologies or two different ways of approaching the same the same problem, the healing problem, the rejuvenation problem. Uh, because, yeah, contemporary world sees aging as a disease. So um, this is also this is also kind of extremely problematic in the sense that uh, uh, it constantly aims at rejuvenation on expense uh, of, of other species. And so these sculptures uh, is also a kind of a combination uh, between uh, very organic materials and uh, also synthetic ones. And these glass, glass faces, let's say, uh, or glass masks uh, that, uh, that you can see in, in many of, of these sculptures uh, derived directly from uh, a fossil of a horseshoe crab uh, which was made into a mold and then uh, blown into a mold. So it, it was kind of uh, immortalized, let's say, through, through this glass blowing process. Uh, so it stands for, for this uh, kind of immortality, let's say. Uh, and here you can also see a combination of natural leather, fur, uh, silicone, rubber, um, and in previous uh, images also heat, uh, thermoformed uh, plastic. So it's really kind of, uh, again, this kind of hybrid, hybrid bodies that you're seeing, but they also have a bit of this, yeah, let's say kind of shamanistic uh, appearance, let's say. And so we were interested in this kind of zombie tissues and organs without, uh, Kind of centralized brain that are generating surplus of life uh, or let's say these are uh, organs without bodies as opposed to bodies without organs um, and uh, this project led to uh, a huge huge installation i think the biggest to date that we made it's still the biggest one yes. um, <laughs> that we also presented in germany in um, MDBK Leipzig in 2019 in the summer. Um, and here, um, again, we looked at a different uh, field of contemporary medicine um, in which instead of having uh, this kind of direct, maybe invasive relationship to bodies, uh, we have a more sophisticated uh, kind of control of of the health uh, of, of health of, of individuals uh, through basically 
constant self-monitoring uh, and uh, the so-called health data philanthropy. And here in this uh, immersive installation, which was really inspired by and developed specifically for these luminous spaces of, of MDBK Leipzig, uh, the viewers kind of enter into an almost oversized uh, belly or it's kind of a soft, uh, soft and uh, soft fabric that uh, contains these um, transparent uh, organisms, let's say, or, or bellies as well, that are open for inspection. Uh, and they're kind of trans quasi familiar because uh, the, the shapes of, of these uh, plastic parts uh, derived actually directly from uh, internal human organs that were uh, enlarged and reshuffled, recom uh, made with uh, recomposition. Uh, and then it was uh, thermoformed. So it's not something that is uh, completely unfamiliar. It's actually our bodies just uh, enlarged and uh, recomposed. And so basically they uh, expose themselves uh, for, for, for the human eye from, from above uh, and from below. And uh, this, this work uh, conceptually basically analyzes how various uh, self-tracking technologies uh, reinforce the neo neoliberalization of the health system in a sense that uh, it is atomizing uh, care and uh, shifting mostly all the responsibility of the health towards the individual to the patients themselves um, in which um, it's, it's the so-called digital uh, health turn, uh, which not only deepens the already existing social socioeconomic divide um, between those who can afford health care and those who don't, but also creates uh, these kind of new psychological and emotional pressure of shaming, uh, let's say the unhealthy uh, individual lifestyle choices. And uh, we, we uh, read a lot uh, and actually invited uh, a theorist and researcher, Tihasha Jana uh, from the UK uh, to write about uh, this self-tracking technology. So we're basically speaking about the Fitbit and different kind of self-tracking devices and technologies that are monitoring your, your health data constantly that counts your steps, that uh, looks at your blood pressure, that looks at your heart, that monitors your sleep. And you constantly also share this data online and share it with the corporations and other individuals and communities and compete about your better health and things like that. And uh, uh, the Tihaja Jana text also speaks about it directly and uh, to quote uh, that rather than improving social conditions related to health such as access to basic income food clean water and shelter the state has reverted to frameworks of health that emphasize the importance of individual life lifestyle choices this is obviously a privileged position in that our ability to achieve healthfulness is necessarily conditioned by factors such as gender, race, and class. Under the discourse of healthianism, individuals choose to take proactive steps to ensure their own health, end of quote. And so this kind of moralistic uh, position leads to understandings of poor health as kind of a failure of a personal account accountability to your, to your body uh, rather than than the accountability of the state. And uh, also another kind of problematic point in those uh, self-tracking technologies is the fact that uh, they are constantly also increasingly push the users to uh, publish 
and display their data online and this kind of building new data philanthropy uh, in which basically personal data becomes common good and uh, that needs to be mandatorily shared with others and especially with, with the state and the government and corporations. So uh, this kind of digital health technologies in a sense uh, encourage self-surveillance and uh, through that uh, we we can speak about data valence because uh, it's it's collecting data and the surveillance is taking place through data uh, and this is kind of a, a collection and uh, a collection of uh, huge amounts of personal information data that is uh, needs to be stored and analyzed electronically and so what used to be private interior and inaccessible um, has become exteriorized and tracked and measured and voluntarily or involuntarily exposed to the world. And uh, this way also this installation kind of uh, tries to, to kind of create this, uh, this sense of exposure and voyeurism and so, uh, in a sense, the viewer becomes a voyeur that uh, is peeking into the depth of, of other bodies. So the sensation of this voyeurism is uh, kind of created both uh, through uh, having these uh, transparent, uh, transparent organisms, so you can see it from below, but also you can climb up these uh, ladder structures uh, and peek through uh, above as well. Um, and also this this kind of two two level two levels of uh, experiencing the installation was also inspired by the museum architecture as well because it has this uh, open terraces. Uh, in which you can see other other levels of the museum, other floors of the museum. So uh, it it has this possibility of of seeing other exhibitions uh, from another floor, let's say. So we kind of multiplied this viewing point again. So you can see it even higher than the usual. Yeah, than the usual um, piece. And we also published an expense, extensive <laughs> catalog. Uh, called Underbelly that um, I think you can still get it in the, in the museum or online uh, in which you can find also the theoretical text by the aforementioned Pteha Jana and a writer Ingrid Lukedgad. And um, again, from one piece to another, uh, this, uh, this kind of... Uh, research on uh, digital health turn uh, brought us to a relatively new field of, of medicine, uh, which is called um, virtual, virtual or um, telemedicine and also robotic surgery. So basically it's, um, it's uh, healthcare done either with the help of technologies or by technologies entirely. Um, and uh, it was interesting for, for us to, um, to look at uh, how robotic surgery is replacing uh, yeah, human hands, let's say uh, in surgical rooms. Um, and uh, we looked at different uh, uh, kind of ways the way uh, the surgeons are trained to work uh, with these uh, ex robotic extensions as well. And as you can see, they use quite a, quite a bit of these transparent, uh, transparent mock-ups uh, or, or models of bodies. And so the installation that we presented uh, at Kurlierge Bauer Gallery in Berlin and also uh, in Baltic Art Center in the UK, uh, as well as uh, 
the kind of last chapter was like three chapter show and the last chapter was last uh, autumn in Milan in uh, East Contemporary Gallery. Uh, also resembled a kind of abstracted uh, surgical room, uh, except that uh, the bodies, uh, human bodies, uh, or let's say medical staff bodies are no longer present. They're, they're kind of uh, substituted by technological arms and eyes, uh, uh, while also human, human bodies or bodies of patients are uh, again uh, abstracted in these quasi-transparent uh, shapes or even shells, you can say. And it, uh, this specific project was also um, inspired uh, quite a bit by a Lithuanian painter, already deceased painter, uh, who was making uh, these uh, hospital series of paintings uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, in which she uh, basically depicted uh, different, different scenarios in, in the hospitals. But uh, for us, it was extremely interesting how she basically abstracted uh, bodies into uh, specific states or modes uh, and uh, they're very fragmented uh, and uh, they're really kind of taken over by technology and draperies. Uh, and they're very kind of cold and uncanny in a sense. Uh, so it's kind of really diminishing uh, this, this biological body in vis-a-vis -vis the, the technology or, or this big medicine, uh, medical science, let's say, and medical field, although it's meant to, to help you in a sense, but it doesn't look like from, the, from her imagery and uh, yeah we in our installation we also used uh, we're interested in this method of fragmenting uh, using uh, this kind of uh, a lot of drapery and this almost like surve surveilling uh, moment that you can find in her work as well uh, so we were interested in um, in kind of looking at these different uh, uh, ways of digital healthcare and virtual healthcare uh, or care made in through distance. Um, but at the same time, unlike uh, this Lithuanian painter, we were not directly uh, being extremely uh, let's say critical or negative about this digital healthcare, but uh, it was more to question uh, what is care at the same time and uh, does uh, human care uh, is always necessarily better um, than technological care. And uh, there was an interesting study by uh, Janet Paul, uh, in which Janet Pauls, in which she researched uh, a group of people that were uh, using telemedicine uh, for, for, for their health monitoring. And uh, there were diver diverse kind of answers about it that uh, sometimes they feel better to, to speak to some kind of machine rather than to call an overworked uh, medical staff that is busy and uh, you feel like you're you know, disturbing them all the time. So she kind of disturbs this notion of warm hu human care and cold technological care. It's mostly about different fittings and different situations in, in, which, in which humans uh, or patients feel, feel more, care more cared about. Um, it, so at first it was uh, less about uh, kind of criticizing very much the, this technological care, but uh, more to speak about, again, uh, how 
a specific kind of economic uh, disadvantage forces people to use that kind of uh, care system uh, or let's say that uh, people have to be people that live remotely need to need to use it uh, it's it's more about again this um, this danger of of uh, health data gathering uh, by corporations uh, that was also kind of an issue for for us uh, and so at baltic we also changed the, the room uh, atmosphere because usually it has this kind of cozy wooden floor which we changed into gray vinyl so it looks more more cold or uh, vinyl that you can find in the hospital environment and uh, this kind of hanging structure also refers to surgical lamps um, but the hands uh, or the these uh, stainless steel arms let's say also refer to robotic robotic arms so it's something like a hybrid hybrid piece between uh, something that is monitoring but also reaching towards uh, these uh, these transparent uh, organisms that are laying on the uh, surgical tables uh, and at the same time you have these uh, round glass uh, objects uh, hanging that also resemble the surgical lamps um, but uh, here they have the more like a warm uh, warm tones that might kind of evoke uh, more of a kind of warmer approach to to these objects but at the same time they might resemble lenses that are also monitoring or maybe surveilling the these pieces it's it's really how you come to the show in in which mode if you're uh, in a paranoid mode you might look in one way or maybe look another and in Carlier Gebauer, um, the absent touch uh, installation here of more uh, kind of colder tones. And uh, we also introduced uh, photographs that you um, might find perhaps in some kind of hospital environments as well, where you see uh, kind of unfamiliar fragmented bodies or some kind of procedures taking place. So here it's even more kind of uh, estranged and uh, you can't really recognize what is, what is happening, but it definitely looks kind of invasive and uh, resembles uh, some kind of medical procedures. Um, so, this, this is an installation in Milan, this kind of a last chapter in, in which we used the uh, resin, resin made bodies instead of thermoformed bodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, basically the very last chapter uh, that we will speak about today is quite short uh, and it's quite a big leap, let's say from, because this, uh, this installation kind of uh, finish this chapter of uh, of direct uh, medical field that we were uh, researching, and this one of the last installations we did uh, was uh, in Kolnas Biennial in Lithuania, and we had an opportunity to make an installation specifically for uh, an historic zoological museum uh, in Kolnas that opened in the 50s and hasn't changed since then basically. And it was extremely interesting um, because they allowed us to work within the exposition itself. Uh, and so the installation um, became as a response to this incredible environment. And um, it was inspired by by the actual specimen that we saw there. And uh, it was in the insect uh, section and uh, we saw these incredible wasp nests and we were fascinating by this non-human architecture that is built entirely through, 
through basically uh, saliva of of these uh, tiny animals, saliva and collaboration. Uh, so, and at the same time, it's something that it's so laborious to make and then so easily abandoned when it's necessary. So it's something, uh, again, that we can learn from, from other species. And uh, in this installation, which is called Skewed Taxonomy, uh, we wanted to present uh, works that might resemble some kind of specimen that you find in, in a zoological museum cross-mixed uh, with uh, something that you can find in archaeological museums. So some things, some fossils from the future in which kind of uh, human parts are blend with um, animal and technological species. So uh, these are uh, still uh, still kind of uh, unknown, uh, unfamiliar species uh, that are difficult to put in uh, direct taxonomy. Uh, so it was a bit of a critique of um, this human wish to rational, rationally kind of sy systemize uh, all the uh, diverse uh, diverse uh, environment in which we're living uh, and also put it in very strict uh, uh, strict order um, but uh, we're kind of celebrating this hybridity and cross species uh, in in these piece, in these pieces and uh, we actually used uh, real uh, wasp nests um, in combination with with this long finger-like glass sculptures, glass elements uh, with some resin parts, again, silicone, sand, uh, uh, maybe in here, yeah, you, you can see the, the combination of these different materials uh, and also some rubber parts uh, and textile and uh, piece and yeah, even bamboo, uh, bamboo parts. So it's uh, really very much inspired by the, the space, the, the collection that they have. And also this kind of variety of species that are no longer there. So it's kind of a extremely interesting, but also extremely sad museum because uh, so many of these specimens no longer exist. So it's kind of a already archaeological museum in itself, um, which was interesting for us as a starting point. So yeah, this was the, an installation we did last uh, November. Mm -hmm. And this would be it for now, which is quite a lot already. Thank Indeed. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's make like a 10 minute break and then directly uh, jump into the Q&A session. Um, <clears throat> thanks again. You want to add anything? No, you'll find the link in the um, description as always. Okay. Yeah. See you in 10 minutes. See you in 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Looking forward to <laughs> the Q.